and welcome to our debate tonight. And I may be the first person uh, here at AAAI to welcome you to New Orleans. So wel welcome everybody to the, the prelude to Mardi Gras here at uh, New Orleans. So today we have an Oxford-style debate, which as you can see is a really formal affair. And our, our goal is to consider the question, advances in machine learning have displaced the need for logic in AI. We have a distinguished panel here that I will uh, introduce in a moment. Uh, but first of all, let me frame uh, how this debate will go. So the focus that, that we've asked our panelists, our debaters here to consider is on what our research priorities should be today in the context of how systems in the future are gonna need to work. So we're not gonna ask them whether contemporary narrow AI kinds of systems benefit today from, from logical tools, nor are we gonna ask them to consider whether recent AI successes have or have not depended heavily on logic. Instead, we're gonna ask them to think a little further afield about the impact of the kind of research that we can all do here today. Uh, as I hope I'm signaling to you right now, our goal here is to have fun, so we're striving to be equal parts informative and entertaining. Uh, in that vein, um, part of the Oxford-style format is to ask our debaters to argue as forcefully as they can for the position that they've, been, uh, that they've taken on, regardless of the more nuanced views that they may themselves have. Then, uh, in the last phase of the debate, they'll take off their masks, uh, as indeed I will do after these opening remarks, and uh, then they'll consider the middle ground and reflect on which points they find most convincing that were made by their opponents on the other side of the debate. So, our format will be five-minute opening statements from uh, each um, debater alternating between the for and against sides. We'll then have a 30-minute discussion period We'll have two minute concluding remarks from each debater. And finally, we'll open things up to the audience and uh, in the time that remains to us before they ask us to leave the room, we'll, we'll give the final word to all of you. So now for our debaters, uh, let me introduce them to you in the order in which they'll speak. First, we have Bart Selman. He's a professor of computer science at Cornell University. He's worked in knowledge representation, efficient inference using SAT solvers, and multi-agent reasoning. He has a general focus on computational efficiency and complexity trade-offs. His most recent interests are in, in AI safety issues, scientific and mathematical discovery, and deep reinforcement learning. And he generally claims, at least in his bio, to love logic. Uh, Bart discovered early in life that he can't work in an office, nor can he start before noon. Um, he was therefore forced into academia and spends mo most of his time working in coffee shops. I have to say, personally, that's the most inspiring thing I've ever heard in one of these bios <laughs> from my own point of view. Uh, our first uh, debater speaking against will be Gary Marcus, uh, sitting here uh, in the third position. Um, he's the uh, former founder and CEO of Geometric Intelligence, which was acquired by Uber, and is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at New York University. He focuses on cognitive architecture and natural artificial intelligence, and has published work in leading journals in a wide range of areas, including language acquisition, cognitive development, development psychology, neuroscience, genetics, and common sense reasoning. His motto for doing cognitive science is, by any means necessary. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think we're all gonna find out tonight. He's also an accomplished unicyclist and juggler, and the author of a bestseller about his misadventures learning to play the guitar which, if time permits, we might ask him to do at the end of the debate. Uh, our uh, second speaker on the fore side is Tom Dietrich, who's a distinguished professor emeritus of computer science at Oregon State University. He works on fundamental questions in machine learning and applications in computational sustainability and robust AI. His hobbies include listening to flamenco guitar, although he's directed me to say that he's never heard Gary play. This might be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> Our final, our final debater is uh, Francesca Rossi. She works at IBM Research and is a professor of computer science at the University of Padova, currently on leave. She's worked on symbolic constraint and preference frameworks, preference aggregation, and multi-agent decision-making systems. When she doesn't work or travel, Francesca loves play, spending time with her cat Spock and painting portraits. 
there we go. This is our esteemed uh, panel of debaters. Let's all give them a round of applause. All right, and with that, I'm going to uh, cede the floor to Bart. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll start off with, uh, I forgot which side, but I think I'm for the machine learning side. Um, so I'm, I'm reflecting first on what brought a logic in AI, and, and we have to go back to Joe McCarthy, uh, really one, one of the founders of our field. Um, and he initiated the view of AI systems as knowledge-based systems. Joe McCarthy was, was driven by the development of general AI, and he envisioned systems with, large, with a large knowledge base of explicitly represented knowledge about the world and other agents. And an inference mechanism would be used for the system to apply its knowledge to decide what actions to take and how to deal with novel situations, thereby giving it a high level of flexibility. Uh, McCarthy was drawn to logical representations in part because of how powerful logical statements can be to rep in representing information. For example, all knowledge about the arithmetic and natural numbers can be captured in less than a dozen statements in first order logic using Peano's axioms. Similarly, uh, set theory can be formalized by Sermela Frankel set uh, axioms, set theory axioms, using about a dozen axioms. Uh, everything else can be derived uh, via automated deduction, via reasoning, at least in principle. So starting in the early 80s, <clears throat> there was a realization that this wasn't quite enough. Much of our knowledge is uncertain and probabilistic in nature. Uh, so we saw Uta Pearl's development of Bayesian nets, the development of logical language with serious probabilistic components, such as Pedro Domingo's Markov logic and Stuart Russell's block formalisms, and of course, uh, the rich world of graphical models. Okay. In my view, uh, a key stumbling block for McCarthy's program is not the choice of representation language, whether it's logic or, or some probabilistic formalism. It's much rather the difficulty of actually building such a knowledge base. Um, so, and, and that brings me to my position here, that deep nets are now offering interesting new glimpse of hope on how to build very large common sense knowledge bases or general knowledge bases. And I wanna illustrate it by reflecting on the success of all of a go and in particular all for Go, and in particular all for Zero for chess now. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> Go and chess are fully within the world of logic, okay? There's no uncertainty, no incompleteness, purely discrete, each state is a win, loss, or a draw under perfect play. Also, the domain is inherently brittle, nonlinear, non-config, and combinatorial. The brittleness is clear when you realize that moving a single piece, a single square on a chess or a Go board, will often flip the game theoretic outcome. From an AI perspective, I believe chess research has been quite frustrating. Uh, in the early days, it was felt we should be able to find a way of encoding learning, uh, or coding or learning chess knowledge, the kind of knowledge that is in a grandmaster's head, and not having to rely on brute force style search, which basically projects out the rules of the game forward in time. However, search-based approaches remain far ahead or remained, I should say, far ahead, and the computer chess community gave up on even trying to encode chess knowledge, I think around the early 80s. The underlying reason appears to be the difficulty uh, of using logic or symbolic formalisms to encode common sense knowledge or to encode chess knowledge. The way chess program designers express their frustration is that you can have general, reasonable general rules for chess, for high level chess knowledge, but when you actually play a game at, 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 at a chess master, at grandmaster levels or, or, or even professional levels, the game appears to revolve around the exceptions to those rules, or even more dramatically around the exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions, et cetera, of the general rules. This appeared to make it the construction of general knowledge base, encoding all these kinds of exceptions, infeasible uh, for chess. So even when AlphaGo first came out, it still appeared to me that the search in terms of Monte Carlo tree search was inherently ne necessary. The deep net could be viewed as learning a good search heuristic, which provide great search guidance, but not quite the same as replacing search by knowledge. Also, initial attempts to use reinforcement learning for chess were still not as successful as the search-based approaches. However, so the most recent success of Alva Zero for chess, which learned to play chess from, from the ground up by self-play, I think in about three hours, and, and 
and, and came to, to uh, almost to top level, to basically top level play. Um, but even more excitingly, even if you turn the search off, you already have a very good chess playing program. It showed that you can already get very high performance for chess using purely the learned deep net knowledge. So to me, this is now the first example of a successfully construction of successful construction of an extremely rich knowledge base, knowledge base of chess knowledge. Uh, the deep chess uh, net effectively acquires uh, or learns real chess knowledge from exploring billions of lines of play and compiles it into a few hundred thousand parameters. So the dream of the 1670s uh, in the chess world, uh, chess play community of a knowledge-based chess program has been achieved against all expectations. And we now have a truly knowledge-based gameplay, which is much closer to human play than any search paradigm. Of course, compiling or learning common sense knowledge may re remain far off, but at least there is hope. So in my view, deep nets are a major step forward uh, in McCarthy's vision of knowledge-based systems for general AI, even if deep nets do not explicitly use logical representation. There's still a key component of McCarthy's original vision of symbolic systems missing, but I'll leave that for the discussion part. Okay, thank you. return to AlphaGo later, perhaps, because I like the argument. I'm supposed to find an argument I like, um, but I have something to say about it. So um, how many people here saw the Newsweek headline that said, robots can now read better than humans, putting millions of jobs at risk, or something like it, um, a few weeks ago, right? There, there were a lot of very exaggerated headlines. A lot of people in this room will realize that it's not true, that humans can't actually read at anything like superhuman levels. Humans. Um, are, sorry, machines can do things like a task called squad. How many people, show of hands, know squad? In the squad task, what you do is you underline a piece of text that is appropriate to the thing you've read. So what machines can do is they can read a passage and they can say, I think the answer is lying over here. But what happens if the answer isn't in that part of the text? Well, most interesting reading that you do involves connecting things that aren't explicitly stated in the text. Um, deep learning has made a lot of progress at things like the squad task and almost none at the other part. You can see the same thing in a movie. If you see that there's a horse's head on somebody's bed, you can make inferences like that person's probably worried that I could be next. Um, it's not stated. You don't have a million training examples of horse's heads in your bed or other people's beds or anything like that in order to do it. Instead, you have general abstract principles that you can reason about, about threats and promises and access and so forth, and you put together the solution that you need. You don't do it um, from your training sets. Take another example, I've been showing uh, images, we're not allowed to do that today, but I've been showing images lately of something called a yarn dispenser. You can look them up on Pinterest or eBay or something like that. And they basically look like bowls but with a hole in them. And once you've seen one, you get the idea. You can work out, you can reverse engineer, what is a yarn dispenser such that it's a bowl with a hole? Well, obviously you put the, the spool of yarn in the main part, then you pull out one piece of the yarn and then you can pull it along and the rest of it doesn't follow and so you can get just what you need. Well, I can show you one that's all pretty of a cat and then I can show you another one that is really hideously ugly. It looks almost entirely different, but you can still recognize that it's the same thing. You can reason about what a, one psychologist would call the affordance of the object, what it allows you to do. You don't need, again, to see a million yarn dispensers. I've just described one, and you could probably now recognize an image of it, and you would know uh, what to do with it. How do you do that? I would say that's logic, that you, again, have principles, and you can make logical inferences. Like, you can guess that the aperture of which the yarn goes through shouldn't be too much bigger than the yarn itself. It should be smaller than the whole ball of yarn, or else the whole thing won't work. So you can make a bunch of inferences. I have not seen deep learning do anything like that um, or any other kind of machine learning technique, more or less. Um, I think that we need to go back to systems that have logic, look at deep learning, say, yeah, they've made a lot of progress. Gradient descent is a wonderful thing. Being able to set a lot of parameters at once is a wonderful thing, but that doesn't mean that we need to get rid of logic. And just so you don't think it's just me who's saying this, there was a great paper that just came out of DeepMind about a week ago about learning uh, noisy 
rules, or Learning Rules in Noisy Data, I think is the title, um, by Lewis and Grafenstedt. And if you read that paper, you will see they focus on exactly what I've been focusing on for the last two decades. So I wrote a book called The Algebraic Mind, and I emphasized universally quantified one-to-one -one mappings. And I said, these are the hard things for multi-layer perceptrons, which are the ancestors of deepness. I said, you're never going to be able to get a pure, unadulterated deep net to do that. Well, they, Grafenstedt and Lewis, who are deep mind, who are not on my pay payroll whatsoever, um, came to essentially the same conclusion in this paper that they just put out a week ago. And they came up with a solution. The solution was what I advocated also in 2001, which is you need um, a few things. You need variables, instances, bindings between the variables and instances. So it's like saying in algebra, x equals uh, 3, and then operations you can perform over those variables. So y equals x plus 3, now you can put the, together the bindings. That's a form of logic. That's what made their system able to do some very basic things like play the game of FizzBuzz that eludes a lot of deep learning networks. So I think that we should be very excited about what deep learning can do. But we should also say there are a whole set of problems we're not really looking at. We're looking at problems like, how do I recognize a poodle from a Labrador? Those aren't problems that drive us towards uh, needing logic. But problems like, how do I watch a movie, see a horse's head for the first time on somebody's bed, and figure out what might happen next, what people's motivations are? That's what would push on logic, inference, and reasoning. We're not really working on that now. If we did, we would see that logic is still important. Thank you. someone could get from the aesthetics of yarn dispensers to y equals x plus 3 in five minutes. Well done, Jerry. 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> Our uh, third debater is Tom Dietrich speaking for the proposition. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about two things that I think really make logic logic. One of those is the use of, of Boolean uh, predicates and connectives to state things about the world, and the other is the use of logical inference. Uh, and I think that, that both of these things are things that are, that are not going to scale, have not scaled, and really have not worked out for us, and that uh, are reasons why the alternatives provided by deep learning methods are what's going to carry the day in the long term. So uh, let's think about, for instance, uh, the, the, the case of a contract. Um, you know, there's been a, a lot of excitement about how we might be able to use blockchain to have self-enforcing contracts. And so, but that requires that you express the contract precisely in logic, and it's failed. Why? Because it's very hard to express a contract in logic, right? And, and both parties will then end up going to court and saying, we didn't really mean this contract, we want to relax the contract. It turned out that we thought this is things were going to work this way, but the real world was complicated. And so, the, the, this, so these, this whole idea of self-enforcing contracts is dead and people are trying to figure out what the blockchain is good for uh, besides currency speculation and and money laundering. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so that's the problem is we know that in a lot of, in, in a lot of uh, concepts, probably also yarn dispensers, it's not a crisp zero one concept that can be defined with necessary and sufficient conditions. Instead, we need notions of partial concept membership, which uh, of course Latvi Zade was the pioneer of talking about having fuzzy concepts uh, represented. And we also need, of course, uncertainty and probability and so on. But I think that, that the, uh, so on to the next topic, which is suppose, uh, what about inference rules? So if we think about the fundamental inference rule in logic, modus ponens, or we can think about uh, resolution and so on, uh, these are very dangerous rules of inference. Because for instance, if we have the, the rule, if you rob a bank, then you will then have money after you've robbed the bank. So I go and rob the bank, and then I affirm the, the left-hand side of the rule, and I draw the right-hand side that I now, I'm, I now I'm rich. So uh, should I tweet about that? Would that be a good idea? Or um, maybe I need to figure out how to launder this money with the blockchain before I do anything else with it. So, um, so I think the trouble with logic is that it, uh, it loses the context. The whole idea of discharging the antecedent in an if-then rule is that you can throw away the rule and you just have the consequence. Uh, and, uh, but we know that reasoning is extremely contextual. And so I can easily give you a, a situation, uh, tell you a couple of facts about it, and you'll immediately make a conclusion. Uh, uh, and then I'll tell you some additional facts and refine the thing. And you say, oh, maybe I'd like to change my mind at this point. And then I could give you some more context, and you'd change your mind back to the first case, and so on. Um, so what does uh, deep learning offer? How many seconds do I have left? In, in return. Um, uh, 
suppose we want to do a classic kind of reasoning, which is uh, 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 taxonomic reasoning. Suppose I want to decide whether all ducks are also birds, right? Well, in deep learning, we now have methods for learning generative models of ducks. And we also have, uh, obviously, techniques for learning discriminative models of, of anything, at least from images. Um, and so I, what I can do is, is use my generative adversarial network to generate a bunch of duck uh, images and then feed them to my bird classifier and see what it says. And I'll be able to confirm that most of those ducks will be classified as birds. Um, let's consider another thing that we've loved to use logic for in AI, which is to write strips rules to describe the effects of actions. So I might want to say, well, if I pick up the block, then I'll be holding the block. Um, and I, I could write that rule down, but we know that's just a cartoon of reality. And if you're using, working with a real robot, you're not going to do that. Uh, nowadays, you might use a deep neural network to learn uh, a, a, a predictive model of what happens if I execute this pickup action. Maybe I'll grasp the block incorrectly and drop it. Maybe I'll miss it completely. Um, and maybe I'll pick it up but, and be holding it. Uh, and so I can represent all of that complexity and richness by using data. Now, Gary's making a lot of big points about how we need millions of examples. And I do think we're not learning as much as we could from our examples. We're currently brute forcing it. But I think that's the same idea that was used against uh, chess, that we would need to do deep, deep, you know, billions of, of amounts of search. And uh, uh, now we have, perhaps after doing quite a lot of search, uh, compiled that down to knowledge that can execute with no search whatsoever. Okay, so I, I start from a different point of view, which is not that logic should be used for everything, and we have had examples of where logic cannot be used for everything because it's too brittle, it doesn't represent enough all the nuances of real life. Uh, but uh, my point of view is that uh, we can leverage both sides of these debate positions. You know, we can leverage what deep learning can give us uh, with a lot of, uh, when there is a lot amount of data, uh, we can leverage what logic can give us with abstraction, symbols, inference, causality, and all these other uh, important ingredients of the way we reason. Uh, we know that, uh, I mean, we know, we think that inside our mind we have both perception and reasoning capabilities. We have system one and system two, to say, like da Daniel Kahneman says, and uh, I don't mean to say that by build in building our AI system we should mimic what is in our mind, but I really think that these two capabilities are both needed. Uh, nature decided that they are needed for us, and I think that we, they are both needed also in our AI system. I also envision AI system that are not working in isolation and completely autonomously, but together with humans, and they interact with you with humans over time, and we want, and in order to do that, we need to build systems that humans can trust, that can explain themselves. And the explanation, it seems to me, it requires some notion of causality uh, to define why you're doing something because there is some cause that caused me to do something and not something else. And I find it difficult to believe that you can do that without having a formal abstract symbols that represent this abstraction of the world that represent these uh, inferences. So overall, I mean, this human AI interaction, the need of building trust, explainability, interpretability, the fact that you have several domains so when there is not a lot of data. Now, I agree that maybe in the near future we may understand how to do unsupervised learning or maybe learning with less data, but right now, I mean, we need a lot of data curated data, and uh, in some domains this is not available. So in that case, really, deep learning is not providing a lot of help. And uh, there are also some domains where you have a lot of domain knowledge already expressed in terms of symbols and abstractions, and uh, it doesn't seem to me that using deep learning and forgetting this formalization of this uh, domain knowledge uh, can help. We should leverage the existing domain knowledge represented in an abstract and symbolic way and combine it with the deep learning capabilities. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, now we've heard a lot of uh, really thoughtful and cogent points from our four debaters. 
this is now the, the portion of the, uh, the, the debate format where we ask the, the debaters to roll up their sleeves and get into it with each other. Uh, this is why I'm uh, sitting one sword length apart from, from the one team and the other team, uh, so, so that I, you know, someone expendable is there in the middle uh, just, just in case. Um, we're, uh, uh, under the Oxford rules, uh, the, the debaters are meant to ask each other questions, which they're encouraged to do, and uh, in, in the event that uh, they're too polite because we're not really uh, you know, here at Oxford, uh, then uh, I'm also prepared to uh, prime things with some questions of my own. Um, Maybe um, I'll, uh, I'll begin by asking a question. Um, what would evidence that logic is or isn't needed in AI look like? We've heard uh, a bunch of kind of uh, you know, arguments from very different points of view about logic maybe being necessary or not being necessary, but this kind of appeal to evidence uh, in most cases without really articulating what, what the kind of evidentiary basis would be. So, what, you know, on what basis would we feel like we'd seen enough evidence that we would know how to make a decision? Well, uh, one thing I think would not count would be uh, that we need to use logic to, as a interface, user interface language between humans and computers. Uh, I mean, we use natural language for this purpose too, but, uh, but we've gotten into a lot of trouble in AI by trying to use symbols from natural language in our knowledge representations. Uh, and so uh, uh, there's the, the famous artificial intelligence meets natural stupidity uh, te tech report that Drew McDermott wrote many, many years ago, and all the young people in the room, you should go look this up. But one of the things he criticized the community for doing was thinking that because we had written down, you know, pick up X implies hold X, that that actually meant that when we pick up a, an object, we would be holding it. It was, it, it was just a set of uninterpreted symbols in the computer, and those somehow have to be related to the, to the physical world. So I guess the, the, to turn this to the positive, I would say, uh, you know, if we could, if you could show that the only way to do certain functions was to do symbolic reasoning, uh, logical style symbolic reasoning inside the computer, then that would be strong evidence uh, in favor of it. But I don't think. I think there's a growing set of tasks that are problematic, at least for one class of models, sort of pure feed-forward multi-layer perceptrons with many layers. Um, and then the question, but I think they're all solvable tasks. It's not that I think that they're magic and no system of any sort can solve them. Um, and it's not even that I think that no system that incorporates deep learning can solve them. It's that I think that when you find the solutions for these problems, there'll always be something in the system that maps onto variables, bindings, um, operations over variables, and so forth. And th there's a discovery process there. So somebody can come with a unanalyzed neural network, let's say, and they can say, I've got a solution. And we should say, okay, but how does your solution work? It's sort of like doing neuroscience. If somebody said, I've got a brain that does such and such, you'd like to know how the brain does that thing. And what I have seen watching neural networks for two decades is that people often forget that step and they get involved in a conclusion that is, hey, neural networks or deep networks or whatever can do this. Um, so now we have these hybrids and I think we need to think carefully about the hybrids. So hybrids are things like the system by Lewis and Grafenstadt that I just mentioned and I don't even know if we have a name yet, but for a bunch of things I'll call differentiable programming or something like that. Where I would say they're kind of like deep networks, you know, gradient descent is critical to their success. Um, but they're also symbol systems in a certain way. So they have operations over variables that are critical to how they work. And that's actually direct and explicit in those systems. Now the question is we're gonna get some other systems where variables and operations aren't explicit and maybe they solve these tasks and maybe they don't. They can solve these tasks like Lake and Baroni's generalization task or the FISBIN task or um, FISBUS task that um, is, is in the um, graph and step paper and so forth, then we can say, well, what is the mechanism? Let's do the neuroscience, so to speak, on these. W what are the individual units representing? And, and you know, if we can make a mapping onto the apparatus of symbol manipulation, then score one for Fodor and Marcus and whoever's been um, harping on all of this. And if we can't, then, you know, then we've got something new and that's great. Then we have a new set of algorithms to think about. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll make a point that couldn't make it my introductory remarks. So I'm, I'm quite excited about you know, what Deep Blue is. Oh, Deep Blue. <laughs> Oops. The game flavor of the month. Like all for zero. Uh, <laughs> achieved, but yes, Deep Blue was a while back. Uh, yeah. uh, and it wasn't even deep, but pretty deep. 
Um, but <laughs> but it, I, I sort of reflected on, on, on that notion of knowledge base toward the Nikit net, and I think the knowledge is really there. I think it plays chess much more closely to how a, a grandmaster plays chess. A grandmaster doesn't seem to search 100 million, 200 million positions per second. Uh, it relies on, on, on some kind of knowledge about chess. Um, but then I thought like, to do a little uh, Gedanken experiment where you say, okay, I'm playing against uh, Alpha Zero, and now I want to say uh, for the next three moves, uh, don't move your pawns, don't move a pawn. Um, and a human chess player uh, will adapt, will, will still make reasonable moves, will basically adapt uh, his or her play uh, to take that new idea into account. I can't move my pawn for the next uh, three moves. Uh, Deep Blue, IBM's Deep Blue is search-based uh, uh, chess program will also take it into account and will actually still give you near optimal play uh, under that new constraint. But the Deep Net system is, it can fundamentally at this point not take it into account. It, it can decide not to make an illegal move, so it can decide, okay, I can't move my, my pawn, I'm gonna look at my, what evaluation function, uh, what my Deep Net computes and, and, and move the next best thing. But that doesn't incorporate the idea that I can't move a pawn for the next three moves. So I do still feel that, that uh, the human knowledge about chess and that the, the, the grandmaster will incorporate is, is in some sense quite different and has a certain accessibility uh, involving ideas such as sub-goals and, and, and plans and, and how to achieve something on the board that the deep net does not have. Uh, now, That's I'm, where you're no, I am. I am. Please so, migrate. I am. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. I am. I am. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I, was, I was paid to be on this side. Um, <laughs> you getting paid for this? Yeah. Oh, only one person can be paid. Um, anyway, um, so <laughs> you didn't know that. Okay. Uh, um, so, but, but so, so, deep, so that's what I think is shortcoming. And actually, I think a role of, of, of uh, people with history and working AI and the AAAI conference is to actually be a little more critical about, you know, the, uh, despite all the successes of, 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 of deep, uh, deep learning and, and, and what deep nets provide, to actually look for those uh, capabilities, and, and Gary is uh, one person to point us out, what the nets can do. I, I just see it more as a, ha a glass half full issue, uh, because I think deep nets, if we train them differently, not via millions of games, but as a grandmaster trains it, we, we may be able to incorporate those notions into deep nets uh, of, of, of goals and symbols and things like that. Yeah. Well, but may, so maybe I'll reply to what Gary said. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, when we look at these deep nets and we do uh, neuroscience on them, we're just telling fairy tales, right? That's not how the net works. It's not a causally correct, faithful explanation of what's going on. It's just a story, and you know, uh, we've seen recently at least all the work that's been done on explaining deep nets so far, including work in, in, our, in our lab at Oregon State, uh, is basically finding some very approximate, simple uh, uh, explanation for a particular situation uh, in which we can write it down as natural language or some sort of symbolic description. But it's fundamentally invalid outside of a very tiny, tiny region. It's a Taylor series approximation to what the system is really doing. And, and we know that that's true of an awful lot of other human behavior, like human explanations, too. So um, why do you think that, that, will, that, that it would really be possible to boil down the complexities of the system down to uh, a symbolic account? Well, well, I'm saying that it's an empirical question in different systems. I know Precious Little is a system, but it's very different. Um, in, in different extant systems, you can actually read the method of the model, and in some cases, the rules and the variables and so forth are explicitly there. So there are explicit, you know, load and store operations from memory and so forth that I don't think could reasonably be not called operations over variables. This is how we build microprocessors, and it's how you build a neural Turing machine, and it's how you build um, the, the Lewis and Greffen set, um, I guess you call it delta I LP model, and so forth. So there are cases where there's a transparent method. There are some other cases, like the one that you're talking about, where maybe you can't make the mapping fly. And if you can make the system, one of those systems capture this set of problems that I'm starting to enumerate, the Lake and Baroni and the Fizz, fizz Buzz and, and my own extrapolation problem and so forth. If you can get a system 
to solve those problems without anything that maps on, then I concede defeat. Then you've got a variable-free system. But there are some systems that are explicit hybrids now, and people are more or less explicit about those hybrids. But where you can say, look, this is the rules. I mean, these are the variables. These are rules it's adding to the database, and so forth. So there you can make the mapping. And I'm leaving open whether there are other kinds of systems where people don't say what they're doing, where you can make the mapping. I'll just say one more sentence. I come to this from the old past tense debate. And there were models there where people said, I have no rule here. And then you would look carefully in the fine detail in the back of the thing, and there would be an ad ed node. There'd be a node for the ed morpheme that is really what the rule is responsible for. And there was a concatenation pathway. I go through this in chapter three of the algebraic mind. That's an example of a system where if you actually look to see what it was doing, you'd have to say it was doing operations over variables. But what the people who presented it said is, it's a neural network, as if it was like the other neural networks. And it's that move that I'm really worried about, where because it's almost like not a truth in advertising. There are systems like what you're talking about where there are no rules, and that's fine. Those, those will be the counterexamples if they can do the right set of tasks. But I guess it would be a typical logical move to say if there exists even one case, then we need logic. No, the logic would be <laughs> if there is, au contraire, the logic would be if you can show me one case that can do this sweep of tasks without being mappable onto, then I will concede. I'm torn between my desire to see these guys fight vigorously with each other and my desire to hear what, what Francesca has to say. And I, I feel it's time for the, the latter to win out. solves the problem, but there, but if we find some tasks, maybe not just one or more, uh, where uh, actually abstraction of symbols are needed, for example, for my point of view is when you interact with humans, you need to interact in a way that we understand, and we understand by making analogies, by doing inferences, by looking at the cause and the effect, and so we need machines that can relate to us in those terms. And so, I, again, I find it difficult that the machine can do that, uh, and knowing how we reason in a way that uh, is not based on abstraction, variables, symbols, uh, and inferences. So that's my mm, justification and the evidence that I'm looking for. So, so let me remind um, the, the debaters and maybe everyone watching that, that, that the proposition that we're uh, considering right now is that advances in machine learning have displaced the need for logic in artificial intelligence. It, it seems kind of inherent in that proposition that machine learning and logic are somehow two frameworks that are trying to do the same thing. And it, it seems like you know, at the root of some of the discussion that's been happening here has been a, a notion uh, of whether you know, logic is an ingredient that can be injected into machine learning or whether machine learning is another philosophy that, that does what logic is trying to do but, but differently or better or, or vice versa. Uh, it seems like maybe it, it would be interesting to hear from the different panelists, um, what do you think is essential to machine learning? What, what do you think is essential to logic? And are these uh, somehow orthogonal in a sense that they can be put together or are they somehow competing attempts at doing the same thing? A shot at it. Whoa. Um, first of all, there can be displacement. So, in any particular empirical domain, in advance of that investigation, it could be it could go either way. And Bart gave a beautiful example, though I'll critique it a little bit later, um, about alpha zero and so forth, where something that ostensibly looks like it could be handled by rules, you can do mostly without rules. We can argue about the Monte Carlo tree search component, but there's a large um, string of truth to, to what he said. There's a case where rules have been displaced, where there was a way to think about this problem as a rule problem, and it can be solved in a different way. And that's kind of intellectually beautiful, that you know, there's, there's a new way to solve a problem. That's how I felt about the past tense stuff when I first saw it, was, wow, you can solve the past tense with a neural network, you don't need a rule at all. And then I did my dissertation on what kids actually did, and I discovered that getting rid of the rules was not a good move if you wanted to capture the empirical data. It was an elegant idea, it kind of upset the table, and opened up a lot of thinking, but it was wrong empirically in that case. 
And there are going to be some domains where you can get rid of the logic stuff, and some we're arguing anyway that you can't. We're not making either of us the argument that you can never do anything without logic. We're making the argument that there are places you need it. So I might want to reason, or you might want to reason, for example, about is Bart actually arguing for the position that he believes in or not? <laughs> I think he used some fairly sophisticated background knowledge about him, about the field, about um, theory of mind to try to integrate your own answer to that. And I don't see a deep net being the right tool to make that inference. <laughs> So, so I think sort of when I think of logic, I think of more of what kind of things, it, it, what properties it can add that, that are maybe challenging in, in deep nets. Uh, one is abstraction, uh, uh, the, the compositional nature of logical statements that you can concatenate and, and, and uh, get new interesting statements. So I think of logic not so much as a particular, uh, um, first of all, logic, particular formalism, but more what, what kind of uh, capabilities the language or the representation gives you. Um, so maybe why I'm a little on the fence is, is, is you know, I've gone to many phases where I would have my, in my AI class, I would say, well, you know, they just did this with AlphaGo. It's not quite, you know, um, knowledge, or it's not quite capturing uh, Go knowledge, because they still have search in there. And then I would say, well, for chess, it's not quite going to work because chess really would need symbols and you need search. Uh, and I kept, kept having to revise my statements. Um, uh, until now, I have to say, hmm, I guess they do all this stuff. Uh, again, I'm not fully on board that, that everything can be done. I would almost say that, that what may happen in the future is that uh, people working on, on the deep nets and, and, and deep learning realize that things like compositionality of semantics, that there are concepts in logic and in symbolic representation that are very useful in the design of their architectures. And, and then it becomes more a question of at what level of abstractions are you looking at the system? You know, I'd love to look at the knowledge base that uh, AlphaZero has learned about chess and I can even say, you know, what kind of rules? Well, you know, and, and I, what I suspect I'll find is that I can find rules that apply to 99%, even 99.19% uh, of the situations, and the rules will work. But I also think this, the network encodes a little bit extra there, uh, very subtle exceptions. So, um, so, but at a, at a sufficiently high level of abstraction, I might actually be able to talk about rules there. Um, so I, I think the your approaches are, are more complementary, and to argue in advance that, that the need, deep nets can't reach the sort of properties we get out of symbolic representation, that I think is the, the danger. So I, if I can add, um, I, I like your example. If you thought about chess, and you took alpha zero, um, there's a way in which it's good at the rules and exceptions, and there's a way in which it doesn't really have rules at all. And the way to see that would be to play on a bigger board with the same system without retraining. So a human would still understand, for example, that a rook can slide all the way across the board, and alpha zero would never, it would never occur to us, so to speak, that it could do that. And so the rules in all of these deep nets, so the quote rules, are really kind of like emulations of rules, where you have some set of training data, and over that space that surrounds those examples, you have something that looks like a rule. But you go outside that space and it doesn't really work anymore. So that's my example of the larger board. It doesn't really understand what a rook does, what a bishop does, any of that. And you could see it if you forced it to play on a larger board. Whereas Kasparov would probably do okay on a larger board. He wouldn't yeah, be as good. But, be but I would, I would change it. I would say it knows extremely well all the pieces and how to play on that board. Actually, right. probably better than Kasparov. And if you never have certain kinds of generalizations have trouble with, but not others. So it knows it knows exactly about almost very intricate in a very intricate way about every move on that particular board. So and, and it's learned via generalization. Space is much the number of positions, the number of, 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 of game states that AlphaGo has seen uh, or, or, uh, of zero is tiny compared to the total number of states. So it's like ten to the eleven, ten to the twelve states maybe uh, boards versus ten to the seventy for chess. The total search space. 
So it already has done an enormous amount of generalization on that board. And what you're pointing out, there's certain other kind of generalization it doesn't do, and I agree. So. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there is no way that we can say, you know, a certain technique will never be able to do that, you know, because we, we don't know. Maybe there will be another technique, not deep learning, not logic, that will come out, and uh, we will be able to do everything that we want to have an AI system to do. So I don't think that on our side we are saying uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, deep learning or machine learning can never do, you know, in the foreseeable future, uh, some sp specific task. You know, so I'm reluctant to take one specific task and to say, well, for this specific task, for sure, you will always need logic. But I'm sure that uh, instead, uh, in general, uh, really, I don't see how you can get rid of these abstractions uh, uh, combined with the power of the cloud. I mean, AlphaGo is one example, because I mean, it was said already, where search was combined with machine learning techniques. And, uh, and that, that is, uh, I don't, and I don't think that was search was added in a, in a redundant way, no? So it was added because it gave uh, some capabilities that deep learning law did not have. So, but again, focusing on these uh, games uh, is a bit uh, um, misleading, I think, sometimes, uh, because they are very, you know, neatly defined and uh, they work in isolation and they do not need to, you know, interact in a kind of scrappy way as we humans are uh, and uh, but uh, although being scrappy you know and so that would be kind of take us away from the neat logic of statements uh, we reason with symbols and abstractions and inferences and poses and so again I think that we need machines that can relate to us on those steps. But we mostly reason with symbols on paper why did we invent logic? Because we can't do it in our head. And we needed to use external memory and external symbol manipulation to solve reasoning problems that we cannot do in our heads. And I think that the, the power of that then seduced, I mean, we, you know, we, this is the time of the Turing machines also and the head writing on the tape. And uh, it really seduced the early founders of AI to think uh, that, that we could scale that up and do all kinds of reasoning that way. But in fact, it's a terrible model of human inference. A much better model of human inference, right, is very short sequences, highly contextualized, of saying, well, if I did this and then did this, it probably works. So, for instance, we, of course, we could imagine training a, uh, uh, a system to predict what happens if you move uh, a rook one position uh, in, an, in a row or column, and you could then imagine moving your attention across the board and moving the rook with you until you reach the edge of the board. And it would do that without ever really, it, it's a, a concrete instance of induction, but, it, but I don't think there would be variables unless you think that uh, moving the, the saccades of your eye count as a variable binding. If you treat that, then, 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 I, then, to, yeah, then I think it's almost meaningless. But. If I can make two quick comments. I do think that people's representation of how a rook moves is an operation over variables. They, they think that they can move a rook an arbitrary number of spaces in a particular direction. I don't think any chess player of any quality would have trouble extending this to a larger board, um, regardless of the fact that they've only trained typically on a game by eight. I mean, there are all kinds of variations of chess that chess players sometimes do, and they don't have any problem with it. Um, you raise an interesting question, though, which is why can't we do formal logic that well? And I have a sort of twofold answer to it, but um, the, the main reason is that binding is actually very expensive for people, unlike machines. So machines have arbitrary amounts of binding, but we seem to have a kind of queue addressable memory. We don't have a master map of where things are stored like any reasonable computer program would. And so binding is expensive, and we have all these kinds of makeshifts to get around it. As long as things are within our binding capacities, we can actually do the formal logic. We get tr in trouble when it's complicated. And the same thing happens in sentence processing. So sentence processing has a lot of the same properties as formal logic. So um, in fact, I would say that to do sentence processing, you have to do most of the things with formal logic, like the variable binding and so forth. And people can do it in short sentences. They can do it in relatively complicated sentences if the individual elements are clear enough and so forth. And they get in trouble when the elements aren't clear because that's a binding problem. But it's not that we can't do the, the variable manipulation, it's that we can't do it well over lar large steps of arbitrary symbols. And that, that's a memory problem, not a, a computational problem per se. 
All right, I think it's the time when we should transition to the closing statements. I think uh, up to this point, I would summarize what we've heard from the panel as AI will probably still need at least a little bit of logic, uh, but it'll probably need to use paper to figure it out. <laughs> 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 if, if any of the panelists disagree with my summary up to this point, this is their chance to set the record straight. Uh, we're going to go uh, in the reverse order that we began. Uh, so uh, our first speaker will be Francesca. So, okay, as a conclusion, I think I like your summary, but uh, and, uh, I think that we uh, there will be tasks and domains where um, right now or in the foreseeable future deep learning cannot help and cannot solve the completely the task because there is lack of data and a lot of domain knowledge and the need for explainability and uh, you know, interaction with humans and so for that reason I think that logic will still be needed and abstract symbols that yes I think you, are, you need to argue for our side that no, I'm arguing for the need of logic. You are arguing for my side. Thank you, but <laughs> <laughs> I think Bart is reminding you that in the Oxford rules, uh, you're being invited to reflect on things you may have heard on the other side. Yeah, exactly. That, that you, know, you, you found meritorious. Of course, if you didn't hear anything that you found meritorious, <laughs> I'll leave it to you not, not to add anything. Okay. No, I found meritorious everything the bat said because it was in our side. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I think that deep learning really showed us, you know, great potential uh, when there is a lot of data to solve tasks that uh, the good old, uh, you know, fashioned AI uh, tried to solve. Uh, for a long time and did not succeed. So that's really uh, something you know remarkable, and that uh, uh, those of uh, us that worked in symbolic AI for a long time uh, maybe did not expect. Of course, the availability of uh, great computing power and the large amount of data helped a lot. Um, and uh, and I, I, you know, okay. So that's what I like in the other side. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, I want to return to a topic uh, that, that Francesca brought up a couple times, which is causality. Um, because I think uh, one of the things that I advocated for in my presidential address uh, is uh, that machine learning people need to spend more time thinking about causality. I'm particularly inspired by Udaya Pearl's work uh, and, and the work of some of his students on uh, showing that uh, causal uh, rules can be transported to novel situations, right? I mean, the, I like to say the only reason we can think about what's going on inside a black hole is because we have causal transportability. We can take the laws of physics and put them in a case place where we can never even observe what's going on. Um, and so, uh, but I do want to think that um, causality is, is also storytelling, right? Uh, and so we, we posit that there are variables that we can manipulate and we manipulate them in the real world maybe we only approxim that, approximate that by our manipulations. They never fully succeed, and the world is more complicated than the causal story. But it is still a very powerful framework for trying to understand and predict about the world much more in a much more general, transferable way than current machine learning. Um, I guess another uh, area that, um, uh, I, uh, to, to address the, the, this question of, well, where should we put our research investment? I would not put all of our money into machine learning or even into deep learning, even though I'm a machine learning person, and you know, I, I would love having more money, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, not in Bitcoin, please. But, um, uh, but, but, uh, but I think that, that we, in order to build systems that we can successfully interact with, uh, in order to build systems that we can be confident will be working correctly, uh, we need to have ways of verifying and validating and, uh, and, and constraining them with background knowledge. And we do find, formal logic, a very good way to, to write those things down. It's hard for us, and we have to use uh, the kinds of theorem proofs that this man produces to check them, to check our specs and see if they're consistent and so on. But that's because we're trying to do something there that's really superhuman. Uh, and for that, I think there's no question that we'll need uh, powerful inference systems as well. Thanks, so then Gary. 
Um, I love the way Bart developed the argument about AlphaGo and AlphaZero. Some of you may know I wrote a very critical piece about Alpha Zero recently. Um, did not like the way that DeepMind themselves developed their argument about what that model should be. Is interesting, why that model is interesting. I think they emphasized empiricism in a way that wasn't there. I really liked the way you developed it in terms of knowledge and, and, and reflecting on logic and so forth. But I do think there were two problems with it. Um, one is that Monte Carlo tree search is a kind of logic. Um, and that it's important that they didn't actually induce it from data. If they did, it would be much more impressive. And the argument you made would be that much stronger. Um, and the other, which Francesca already alluded to, is it's not clear that it's a general model. So it works on a limited board, um, and it probably works for a number of other games, but it's not clear that it works in the open-ended world. I think the fundamental flaw of the deep learning research community or, or the work that they're doing is they tend to work on closed end problems. And Thomas and I had a, a back and forth about whether a thousand categories is a small number and stuff like that, but you can read it um, on Medium where we had this interchange. Um, I think that even a thousand categories is still kind of a closed world. There's, there's a sense in which the real world is open-ended. So you can, if you, all you have to do is move a joystick on an Atari game thing and you don't have to transfer to new levels you haven't seen before, you might wind up with an algorithm working there in the way that you described, obviating the need for logic. But maybe if you take it to other kinds of problems, you might need the logic. And we, we figured that it made sense to ask Bart to uh, give the last word here, because at this point in the debate, we weren't sure sides. which side he would be arguing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking to the Oxford style. Um, <laughs> don't quite believe it, but anyway. Um, so uh, I think as, as, the, uh, as has been pointed out, is, is it's a generalization ability of human cognition uh, is really quite amazing. Uh, and, it, and there is a certain sense that, that symbols and, and, uh, and, kind of, and, and some form of logic uh, uh, can be very useful for that. And I do agree with, with, with the point that uh, deep learning uh, work, although very uh, exciting and, and and surprising, I think also surprising in terms of the achievements uh, when you think about them, uh, has not quite paid attention so much as, as the limitations of, of, of their systems and uh, in terms of what, what things they can't do. And I think it's actually a challenge for the, for the remainder of the AI community to bring out these issues and say your, your system doesn't generalize in that way. Um, could you solve that? Could you address it in, de in deep learning formulas? Or do you have to build a separate mechanism? That I don't know, uh, but I think they should be pushed more um, to, to consider those limitations. Uh, and then they might, you know, depending on how that gets resolved, but they might realize maybe we need symbols after all. <laughs> all right, let, let's give all of our debaters a round of applause. minutes left and as promised we want to give the last word to you so uh, let me take this uh, this last microphone here and uh, hand it off to uh, I don't know Sheila would you be willing to uh, be uh, standing down here with a microphone so if you've got a question um, that you'd like to ask the panelists just come here to the center aisle or, or Sheila will come to you and uh, Please uh, try to keep your remarks brief so we can get through as many of you as we can. I wonder if we should take a slightly different perspective. Uh, deep learning is not neural networks, I think. It's not just chain rule and weighted sums. Uh, it's compositional function approximation. And it's in some sense second order AI. First order AI built uh, functionality itself manually. It's philosophically the most rewarding kind of AI, I think. Second order AI builds machines that automate this. And we currently don't have very good function approximators, I think. The next level is probably going to be meta learning, where we automate the f uh, process of finding these function approximators, which is philosophically even more frustrating because there's going to be a single paper and we are done. And uh, maybe th uh, if we take this perspective, I wonder is it possible that humans are actually meta learners? Do you think it's conceivable that we are not just learning systems that can learn logic and emulate it to some degree? Uh, and our deep learning systems can do this too to a similar degree maybe or maybe even better or maybe not as good because we don't find the right function approximators but maybe we are meta learning systems and the evolution that Gary Marcus hopes bestows some sacred properties on us is just 
is very slow and crude, crude Monte Carlo search for meta learners, which of course we could do better. Don't you think that's possible? So, um, you're here. Um, I think that humans do a lot of meta learning. I think that graduate school is about teaching people to do meta learning well. Um, I think that there's a lot of discussion in the machine learning community is that people are looking for the one algorithm that rules them all. And I don't think we should be looking for that. I think that humans have everything from observational learning to syntactic structure learning. They're probably very different kinds of mechanisms. And that what a good scientist does is they take, put together what they can do with symbolic learning and what they can do with kind of sheer pattern recognition and so forth. They, they, they learn about learning and what tools to use in a particular job. That's not the same thing as like meta learning, which hyperparameters for my neural network are you know, doing what they call it, auto ML or something like that. Uh, but I think there's, there's some role for meta learning that's probably really important. Yeah, I would just caution that we've been around the meta game before. Back in the 80s, uh, it was all the rage. We were all writing meta interpreters for our programming languages and systems are gonna reason about the reasoning about the system. Uh, that didn't turn out to be all that productive and, I, and I'm very skeptical. In machine learning right now, everybody's saying, oh, we're gonna do meta learning. They mean 500 different things by that uh, and mostly auto ML-ish kind of things and that's not gonna be productive. So uh, yeah, I, I remain to be convinced that, that there's any there there. So uh, maybe there's some lessons we should learn from the past. So Bart started off with McCarthy. Uh, many years ago I heard a debate between McCarthy and Shank. And Shank rather mischievously uh, brought up uh, an exchange that he'd heard on the radio. This was a time when there were Russian ships off the coast in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, and the news was a buzz with it. And so uh, the radio station sent out a reporter to interview a man on the street, and the reporter asked the man on the street if he was worried about these Russian ships, and the man said, I'd be more worried if we didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my question for the panel is, which side uh, of this debate would better handle that exchange? <laughs> Clearly the logic side, the, the, the logic side um, has tools for, analy I don't know if you want a serious answer or not, but the logic, the logic side has tools for things like counterfactual reasoning that, that would be helpful there. We certainly need some form of reflection and, uh, and, and that's a big challenge right now for, for uh, machine learning techniques. I think we have time for one final question. Is that a question? Yes, that's oh, a question. Go for it. Question is, how do we know that AlphaGo Zero is actually good at Go? <laughs> I mean, he beat the previous one, but how do we know about the game of Go that is actually good? Well, I, I think we, we know quite a bit. I mean, they, they, you know, they do evaluations in, in, in game settings, and, and uh, I think the interesting thing about Go is actually that you, you have an ELO rating, which is sort of the, the, the rating of the Go playing strings, or the game playing strings. In chess, the interesting thing is we, we're leveling up around 3,200, I think. Uh, almost all programs are there, uh, and, and, and actually the, the deep learning program is also there, so, so they're, we're sort of leveling off. In Go, it seems that the programs are just getting stronger and stronger, meaning you, know, you build a better version of AlphaGo, uh, AlphaGo Zero, you, you boost it a little further, you will beat all the previous versions. So, so I think the one nice thing about the, the, a game domain like that is we, we have a pretty good idea of how good these programs are. Um, they just beat everything else. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I, I'm getting a sign from, from uh, Sheila, who's my boss, that, uh, that there might be one more question. Go for it. So uh, logic is often described as a tool for composition of information, partial information. So the deep learning approach is, oh, we'll just add more units to a network. So is that an alternative? Is that competitive or not? And let's think of a domain to help focus some of the thinking here. So legal reasoning about, say, contracts or regulations. You have very complex sentences in natural language. You have deontics. You usually have a domain, you know, like contracts on a supply chain or whatever. So what evidence is there that deep learning can versus cannot deal with the compositionality required there mm -hmm. without 
replicating a lot of the features that Gary and Francesca were talking about. And obviously in law explanation, for example, is, uh, is very important. Causality is very important with obligations and contracts. So I think it touches on a lot of the things that were raised on, on both sides here. Yeah, let me just uh, briefly say, so I actually do think, if, if you think of sort of the knowledge that is, that is learned by, by AlphaGo, um, I think it has, it does incorporate the notion of com compositionality. It doesn't see enough of the, of the game space. It only sees a very small fraction of, of the possible game space. So often, so most of the time it will be playing in a totally new part of the game space. And the only way to do that is to generalize uh, or to combine features or, or aspects that discovered in, in other settings, uh, other, s other parts of the board. Uh, now it does it maybe not in a standard logical way, but it does combine that information in a, in a very clever way. So I, th I think uh, the network can get a notion of compositionality. It needs to do that, otherwise it would not be able to play in that unseen space. And not to do the legal tasks? Well, I, the, I don't know about the legal tasks, but, but another example perhaps would be the way that people are combining visual information and language or speech and written and that is to have some shared uh, embedding space in which the, the information from both are combined. And so you can get joint constraints there, uh, which I think is a bit more compositional than what you're arguing, because it could be that we've just found like the, 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 some sort of ma a single embedding space that's working for over the chessboard. But in this case, we have different domains where we're having to find a shared representation across them in which we can combine constraints from from the different modalities. So it's a step in that direction, but, but I agree the strength of the, of the sort of deep learning-ish or these continuous representations is, is that we can hang on to the context. The weakness is really how do you get rid of the context so that you can compose with other things. And, but, you know, we have these two forces pulling on our, on our representations. I, I think Google Translate is instructive here, that, that you can get the gist of a document um, without having full semantic representations, without having full logic, and so forth. And if you have a human process that gist, they can, you know, the machine does most of the work and the human can kind of fill in the little bits that are wrong. But did it, you would never use Google Translate to translate a legal contract <laughs> where money was involved. I mean, you'd be crazy to do that. Yeah. On that pessimistic note, unless we can have one more question. Totally agree. <laughs> one more? All right, go for it. Oh, okay. In, in principle, everything can be explained by physics, right? Now, we've long since accepted the notion that chemistry, biology, and so forth and so forth are levels of, um, of abstraction at which certain things can be expressed in, um, in a tractable way that can, in principle, be expressed in physics, but it, it just wouldn't make sense, and it wouldn't make sense to any of us. And so doesn't that make a lot of sense for the logic versus deep neural nets, where I would put the deep nets as and the physics role and the logic as being the higher level. Well, this is exactly on the point I was making about mapping. So you could say, look, I have a neural network description. I have this set of weights, and I have a set of connections, whatever. Um, I mean, connection weights and nodes and, and so forth. Um, and then you could say, does that map on to the next level up? In, at that next level up, does it map onto things like operations over variables? If yes, then I win, or we win. Um, and if no, then we lose. Part. That's just how it goes, right? And it's a question about exactly that mapping. Do you need, or you know, is the chemistry level giving you more concise generalizations that are useful, or is it just wrong? So if it turned out that chemistry did a bad job of describing the underlying physics, we would abandon it. Um, if it turns out that the right explanation is we have multi-layer perceptrons that are kind of impossible to parse. There's no way to draw anything other than a vague approximate mapping onto the apparatus of symbols and variables and so forth. And I was just wrong and I wasted the last two decades of my life. But I don't <laughs> think it's going to turn out that way. Oh, we've all it's, done that. it's only two decades. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting possibility that, that Sun Balls indeed is just a higher, a higher level of abstraction. Uh, what I get from the, from the from learning the chess knowledge, uh, the question is, you know, at what level can you actually learn this knowledge? And uh, what fascinates me is is that that at, at this point, I guess, the deep neural nets can get at that knowledge. Uh, now we can do a study of that knowledge and see, well, maybe there's a symbolic abstraction of it. 
which I think is an interesting story to pursue. Well, and just, uh, you know, one of the examples I like is from the, you know, the breakout arcade game, right, where the, where the neural net learns to punch a hole or build a tunnel through the, the, uh, the barrier in order to get up. Um, and, and Gary's pointed out that there's nothing, there's no localized representation in the program anywhere of this structure that it's creating. But I think that, uh, that you could imagine the system reflecting on its own, mining its own behavior and saying, oh, it looks like every time I do really well in this game, I, the, I create this kind of thing like this. So maybe I should describe my behavior at that level. Or in Space Invaders, it seems that, I, that I've got this behavior where I, I hide underneath this, this thing, and I come out and shoot, and then I go back down here. I mean, hide has got, is my word, but, but could it recognize these patterns in its own behavior by reflecting on it? Y and using then conditional things? logic, say. <laughs> maybe, or, or, or maybe it's just a matter of, of uh, clustering you know, behaviors into little components. But uh, yeah. I, I, you know, setting aside whether it's logic versus not logic, I think it, that, that, that we, we shouldn't rule out a purely learning strategy for, for acquiring this. Yeah. So uh, I like this, this vision that Ben put forward uh, of, you know, the physics level and the, the more abstract level, given in, in our case by the learning and the logic. And uh, I think that, you know, uh, what Tom said is very, you know, I also agree very much that uh, maybe everything can be defined uh, by, yeah, by the physics level, but uh, there are some abstractions that you can derive from the physics level that are, can be useful to help the physics level, for example, to move from one scenario to another one, from one context to another one. Without those abstractions, then you would have to need to restart from scratch at the physics level all the time. So the two levels are both needed. So we win. And I should also mention <laughs> that, deep win, that, de tells that you lose. deep learning is currently in the middle of revolutionizing chemical informatics so that now it's possible to propose new molecules and, get, and predict whether they will be active for certain sites without even going into the lab. So of course, we don't know exactly how it does it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a better way to end this session. Uh, so uh, l let me thank once again my uh, uh, debaters on, on both sides, uh, whichever sides they may have turned out to be on, uh, for uh, you know, sticking their necks out and, uh, and, and joining me up here on this stage. I think it's really fitting that we're beginning AAAI with uh, a debate on this topic because I think this is really one of the world's best kind of meeting points for researchers who span a really wide range of different approaches for addressing fundamental problems in AI. So I hope all of you leave this room and continue this debate amongst yourselves. Maybe pigeonhole one of the debaters if you find them on a coffee break. And thanks again for sticking around.